these are my notes. I just thought I would mention that. These are, these are real notes. If you weren't here earlier, just watch the tape. Uh, to those of you, brethren, that I, when I come this afternoon, if I seem distant or distracted, it's because I was uh, distracted, and uh, that makes me distant. My apologies, but this has been on my mind. Uh, lo, these many months, the previous speakers have served as an excellent introduction. It will save us all kinds of time now so that we can begin. You are familiar with the text, the text that we are focusing on this afternoon, Hebrews chapter 8, the verses quoting Jeremiah's prophecy. And then Paul quotes it again, the text that I'm dealing with in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16. So if you have your scriptures, go ahead and, and be working in that region of scripture. That's where we'll be tonight. Some observations. Some things that, uh, having heard the text read, not only from Hebrews 8, but also from Jeremiah 31, and then also that Hebrews 10, 16, being familiar with those texts, something you might not realize. A few observations as we begin. There, change the wording. The words are different. He, he, it's not a carbon copy of each other. He doesn't just repeat himself. Uh, there is a difference. Uh, in Jeremiah 31, uh, coming through that prophet, it is my law, singular. And in Hebrews 8 and 10, it is my laws, plural. It is in Hebrews 8, verse 10, put into their minds and write on their hearts. And then later, it is put on the heart, singular, and write upon the mind, singular. There's a difference in both the verbs and then in the objects. Now, this may seem uh, not very profound uh, conclusion, but it's still my conclusion. It's probably not that significant of a change. It's the same Holy Spirit writing it. It's the same Holy Spirit speaking through Jeremiah, speaking through Paul in Hebrews, speaking on Paul in chapter 8 and in chapter 10. And for me to try and make some big reason of why there's a put and why there's a right and why there's a difference in hearts and minds and, uh, would probably be going further than is really, really necessary. Suffice to say that the law of God is going to be put on the inside, Amen. on the innermost being. Amen. My laws, he calls them. You'll notice that when he talks about the day coming, he, he doesn't talk about a new law, though. It's a new covenant. Yeah, amen. Without fail, that's how they talk about it. Amen. Don't talk about new law. Brother Given talking about not a new set of books, not a set of new commandments. You don't find that. <laughs> Even if you want to look, and you look for uh, the Christian law, or there are things that talk about a law of Christ, and Paul talks about though being without law, being able to reach those without law, but not without law before God, not as one that is without boundaries and without reason and so on. It's a new covenant. Now those laws that are being uh, put and written upon both our minds and hearts, what laws? Which ones? If you, if you want to think of it that way, which, which ones are, are, is he doing? Is it the two greatest ones? Love God with all your heart, heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. You could make an argument for that, certainly, because all the law and the prophets hang on those two. Is he talking about every command God has ever said? Is he talking about everything God has ever said, whether it's a commandment or not? Because God is the authority, and him saying it makes it law. That could also, perhaps, some of those questions maybe come under the area of, of speculation and vain questions and strivings about the law. And it might engender more worry and hand-wringing and wondering and doubting among people. And it might also lead into areas where you end up wanting to affirm something that when you look at it, you say, well, no, I don't want to affirm that. And then you end up back under the law violating the very thing he said to begin with, that it's not like the one before. Now, Brother Harold is going to be dealing in that ground later, so I don't want to, to go into that too far, but just it, it is different. So if your conclusion ends up with basically the same thing or the same effect of people being driven from God, then there's, there's something wrong. 
one question that may help in, in working through any of these areas is what's the nature of the law? What's the nature of the laws? When God was speaking, was, was he addressing something that was temporal, something that was just for the time, or was it a timelessness to his, to his proclamations? Certainly some things about uh, how you farm and what kind of fabric you wear and those kinds of things, there's, they're bound to time and they're bound to geography and they're bound to a physical covenant, a physical Israel. So those are pretty clear. Any of the, any of the, the laws dealing with temple and tabernacle, there isn't one. You go to the house of worship on that mountain today and that's Muslim. That is a mosque. That is not the temple that is there on that same hill. So certainly anything talking about temple and tabernacle, just from the sheer fact there isn't one, cannot be bound. Uh, regardless of what uh, Zionists there might be that want to rebuild and go that route. One of the uh, renderings of scripture said, I will set my laws in their understanding and write them on their hearts. Another uh, paraphrase has said, I will write my laws in their minds so that they will know what I want them to do without my even telling them. And these laws will be in their hearts so that they will want to obey them. Which I thought that, that begins to point to it. It's, it's not God trying to impose from the outside in anymore. Amen. And he knew it wouldn't work. He knew that's the way the old system was, that here's the law separate from man, outside man, man falling short, man falling short. He knew that's the way it would be. Whenever you want to talk about covenants, and, and there's some that, that will talk a long time about this covenant and that covenant, what Abraham and Noah, and, and all those different covenants, God's the focus in every one of them. I, I don't mean to trivialize the distinctions, don't, don't misunderstand me, but God is the focus. He's the con constant in all of those. It's God's covenant that he's making with man, and you also notice in those, he's setting the terms. You don't read of covenants where uh, the man comes to the bartering table and makes a portion in the agreement. It is God setting the terms of those covenants. By way of, of summary from where we're going this afternoon is the law has moved from the external to the internal. From being outside of man to being inside of man. And we want to examine what is the significance of that. So look at the text again there in Hebrews chapter 8. I will do it, it says. I will do it. The only mediator that he will use will be his son. He doesn't even use a, a code or some kind of ritual or just any old man to do it. But it must be his son. That is the only mediator that can come between, that can be the one. But the Lord is active in this process. He is the one writing the laws on our hearts and minds. Just as his finger wrote them on Sinai and he gave them to Moses, so also is God writing laws on our hearts and on our minds. He's the one planting them in our thinking and our feeling. And once there, it will direct our doing. Amen. The, old, the old method was to show man you can't just do it. You can't just do it of your own trying to get your behavior right, trying to measure up, trying to get everything just right. All the T's crossed, all the dots on the I's. But now God has our mind. He has how we think. He has what we can plan and reason, speculate. He has what we love and desire. He has our hearts. He has not only those, but he has his laws written on them. We are identified with God on an intimate level now. Under, under the Old Covenant, it was for physical Israel, but there was an allowance for strangers and others to come in, but they had to follow the code. And that's, that's how they could come in. You had to follow the code. Well, we certainly were all strangers at one time to this New Covenant, and now we come in, and it is not a following of the code as it is that now God's mind has been put inside us. That's how we know that we're His. That's how He knows that we are His. That's how we know the last part of this, that he's our God, we're his people, because we have his laws in our minds, in our hearts. Mm -hmm. Amen. This has been his plan from the very beginning. He wanted a people truly in his own image, and even more so in the image of his son. Mm -hmm. All men, uh, 
to some degree bear the image of God, certainly. Image that is marred, we acknowledge. But in Christ, now that image is, is sharpened. It comes into a sharper focus. Amen. And that focus is not just a behavioral focus. Let's just stop doing this and start doing that. And we could go through the list of behavioral choices. But that's not it. Wrong covenant. Right, have the right name, right section of scripture. Quoting Paul instead of Moses, maybe. But if your approach is just to get behavior in line so that I can be pleasing to God, wrong covenant. Amen. Go to the end of the line, start over. You're not going to achieve it doing that. And it's a very long line that you're in. Amen. He had to show man that merely seeking to control behavior is totally inadequate for becoming godlike, for achieving godlikeness and especially Christ likeness. If you want to talk about behavioral modification, there are myriads of cults and other false religions the world over that have a much better track record than the Christian church in terms of getting people to adhere to a standard of behavior. Much better. You want to talk to uh, Sun Myung Moon about some of his techniques and some of his effects in getting people to adopt a standard of behavior? Go and talk to the Unification Church. Talk to the Moonies. They have achieved a remarkable likeness among their subjects a remarkable adherence to a code. That is not the new covenant. Amen. And he is not the savior. Amen. The reason that we must go beyond merely trying to control behavior is because the father and the son are holy in more than just their behavior. Yes. They are not just moral, they are holy. Yes. God's name is holy, yes. scripture tells yes. us. He is holy, holy, holy in case you miss it Amen. he of himself inherently within him what he is is holy mm -hmm. and so of course then what he does what he says yeah. now if we come into the new covenant and, and like sister june was talking about you're you're in the you're in the new covenant but you, you just don't realize it sometimes and you still operate as if you were in an old covenant if all your focus is upon your doing and my behavior you won't achieve a true understanding of the holiness of God. It will cheapen you, and it will cheapen also God, and make him into only some moral tyrant instead of a father, instead of Yahweh, a God we can know by his name, one that wants to come and invest himself in us. The Godhead's holiness transcends a functional morality, just Amen. being good. It transcends that. And so also must our religion, and I say that in quotes, our approach to deity, our approach to God, so also must it transcend a functional morality. Amen. Because if we keep the gospel at that level, again, there are myriads of cults that will achieve far greater than we will in terms of conformity and practice. So we don't want to play that game because there's others that are already doing far better in terms of just external righteousness. I, I, I see it in the news. You'll see these reports from the Middle East of people that getting up at the different times of day and praying for this and what they do for that and they observe this festival and that ceremony at great personal expense, too. These, this isn't a light thing for them. And we can't even get people to come to Bible class Sunday morning. We are not about to play the game of morality or an external code of righteousness because the Christians would lose and lose badly. So it is more than that. Though please don't misunderstand me. The gospel is not an excuse for disobedience. Our obedience is not optional merely because, again, in my remarks, our track record doesn't really stand up so well. That doesn't excuse a desire for purity. We'll talk more about that as we go through. Godliness certainly includes a practical, that means practiced, holiness, something that is done. But true godliness, truly bearing God's likeness, involves much more than external behavioral purity. If we as Christians, those who bear Christ's likeness, if our walk with God does not transcend only an external righteousness, then we have no more claim to truth than a devout Muslim, 
or Mormon. And Louis has addressed that. And, and from some of the things I've read, it's remarkable how much they experience this old covenant bondage, even in this different setting, trying to keep the code, trying to measure up. God's laws must be written on more than just our behavior. They must be engraved on the very essence of who we are. What is our nature? Not only what is our pattern of life. Amen. They must be engraved upon the throne of our thoughts and upon the core of our desires Amen. so that we can say, this is what the Lord has said, and I agree with it, and I know it's true. And not make apologies for it. To, to be able to see what God requires, even if it makes a great personal expense on our part, even if obedience is hard, and yet still to have such a unitedness with the command that you can agree it's good. Amen. I, I think of Paul and some of what he, he reveals in Romans 7 where he wrestles with it, but you never read him concluding that the law is bad. He always comes out on the side, the law is good, the commandment holy, just, and good. My own measuring up, now that's, that's inadequate, but you don't hear Paul bad-mouthing the law of God. So I want to be careful that, that any of my conclusions, that I don't fall into that. And, and as Brother Given noted, to, to be almost as if I'm willing to tear out a portion of Scripture and say this no longer applies to us. Be very careful that I don't come in the spirit of the Jehoiakim and take out a pen knife and, and remove the sections that offend me and that conflict with my pattern. Now again, for Christians to neglect external purity, casually pacifying their conscience with a Jesus does it all, Jesus paid it all, and use that as a, a license for immorality, well, that's certainly uh, God forbid. God Amen. forbid. Amen. So for us to be truly in the image of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we must have a holiness that transcends Behavior, a holiness that sinks even into our attitudes, our concentration, our desires. The reason is that if God can gain the focused attention of our innermost being, then he will also capture the territory of our outermost being. And he will get the people called by his name, doing the things he wants done. Amen. I want to be able to say with David, how love I thy law. It is my meditation day and night. I don't want those kind of passages to be taken from me because I have a false understanding of what is my relationship with law, God's law. Again, considering the text at hand, it is personal what God is doing. It is not the tables of stone anymore. It's not even through a charismatic leader that we all just come and, and follow after this man or a strict personal regimen, or a, a, a dietary laws, or, or anything like that. It's not working from outside in. It is something where what is changed is on the inside, and that begins to work its way out. The seed is planted, and it begins to grow and permeate through the rest of the clay. It is God that does it. Amen. It is the same Holy Spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead. It is that same one that enlivens these very mortal bodies. Will not only will enliven at the day to come of the great resurrection, but enlivens now. It's that Holy Spirit that gives us the motion in what we do for the king. He takes his laws, he engraves them upon the tablets that are cognitive. What are we Amen. thinking? What are we contemplating? What are we planning? He engraves them upon the tables that are effective. How do we feel? What do we experience? What does it mean to be human? Even a beast can be made to do a certain behavior. You ever read National Geographic and they train the monkey to do this and there's a gorilla that does sign language now and so on? They can be given a remarkable degree of behavioral modification and, a, and an animal can do this. That bears not the image of God. That does not have Father Adam. Mm -hmm. But what of man? What does it mean to be a man? To be a human. To have a mind, a heart. Not just some muscle that beats and does circulation, but a desire to be able to feel. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the thing that is described in Ezekiel is that fleshly table of the heart, a heart, something that can be molded and guided. 
Again, I want you to think of thinking and feeling. What does it mean to be human? That is the part of you upon which God writes his mind, his desires, his will. And again, this inscribing has the practical effect of refining and correcting and modifying all our actions. Amen. Even to a degree where we repent. And we don't try to make an excuse, but the commandment comes. Whatever it be. How about something as simple as thou shalt not covet? You know, that still applies. Coveting isn't somehow okay now that Jesus has died for us, and it's restated over and over again in the New Covenant mm -hmm. scriptures, that that is out. And so we find something in our behavior that doesn't match up because we have this law that's written on us and a conscience that's being shaped by it. Mm -hmm. A heart that is the fountain and seat of passions and desires. One man commenting on this said that it is the seat of man's personal life and the two terms, the mind and the heart, covering the whole of man's inward nature. All of what it means to be man. Amen. I'd like you to turn to the book of Romans. I want to look at a few of the verses to, to get our bearings. In case I would be misunderstood in, in anything that uh, I, I represent or affirm, we want to go through some of these key passages and get our boundaries. And I think this will help in, uh, throughout the week of study that we have here as well, that we'll be able to see, all right, what, what is the relationship with this old covenant? What is the relationship with the law? In Romans chapter 2 and verse 20, the last half of it describes the law as the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth. It does not describe the law as being somehow deficient and inadequate in reflecting the mind of God or in describing his desires. It's not fuzzy. You know what God thinks. When he, you read in the law about his desire for a holy people, it's very clear. Later in the same chapter, a few verses, verse 29, he is a Jew who is one inwardly and circumcision is that which is of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. Amen. That's the interaction. That's the shift. It goes from a letter to being something that is done through the Spirit. It's a different covenant. Not like the one I made with their fathers. Mm -hmm. Jesus did not come and just give us a new set of tablets. The old ones were adequate. If man could have, uh, of himself, obeyed them, he would have been holy. He would have had the promise of life. But the weakness is through the flesh, Romans 8. Amen. This refers to that. In the next chapter, Romans 3. I want to read this, this uh, last half of the chapter, actually. I want this to set up some of the boundaries in our thinking. Well, how is it appropriate to talk about the law? Is, is it appropriate to speak of the law as, as being extinguished and demolished and, and inadequate and just set aside, cast away, thrown away? Or is it appropriate to talk of the law as being something we are still under and something that we are bound to and will be held accountable to? I want to read verses 19 through the end. We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. 
For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And just pausing there. It's very clear that, that we are not under the law, that that is not the means of our obtaining righteousness. That's very important. That whatever uh, I might say about the importance of the law and the significance of it and God's law being written on our mind and heart, whatever I might say, please don't misunderstand. I, I'm glad like Brother Louie, I'm glad I'm born when I was. I don't want to go back under that system. Uh, as far as I know, I can't trace my lineage back through Shem. I think it comes through Japheth. We didn't have the promises. We didn't have the covenants. We didn't have anything Amen. except some verses here and there maybe in Scripture that would talk about being a light to the Gentiles. And some of these things, these glimmers where God reveals there's more going on here than just Israel. Amen. Finishing the passage, verse 29. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. So circumcised or uncircumcised, Jew or Gentile, it's still the same economy, faith. That is still the means of our justification. Amen. Now this last verse, do we then nullify the law through faith? God forbid. May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. And when you go through Matthew through Revelation, you find that stated over and over again. Favorable words about the law. Not willing to just, well, it's obliterated. It's been dissolved. And so it's of no importance or no significance any longer. Instead, it is very significant. Well, that, that is a good summary there in Romans 3. There are other passages. We could talk about Romans 7, the first part where he talks of, of the marriage and the husband dies, the wife is freed from that covenant. We talk about the released from the law of verse 6. Uh, I'll just refer to the first part of Romans 8, the first few verses that talk about uh, the weakness through the flesh. Then it talks about a law being fulfilled. There are many passages we could go to, in Romans in particular. Read that. Read Galatians. Read First and Second Corinthians. You're going to be hear, hearing them quoted quite a bit this week. But suffice to say that if you operate with law as a master, you will be in bondage as a slave. Yeah. If that is your approach to any law, be it... Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5 of the, the, the basic 10, be it the 600 plus commands of all that God said that the physical Israel was to obey, or be it the Sermon on the Mount or anything else you find from Genesis through Revelation. If you approach the word of God as a law that is a master, you will be forced into your role as a slave and you will be in bondage. Amen. Now, again, I have to qualify this. Uh, lest people leave making the same charges that were made about Paul, I am not saying that we are without bonds, that we are not without boundaries, that we are not without obligations. We are free, but we are not free to be wicked and free Amen. to be carnal and free Amen. to be the old man. Amen. So that, that's very clear. I just don't want to be misrepresented. When you come to the Word of God, wherever you're reading, if you come to law and you see in it, this has a harmony with my nature, mm -hmm. my new nature. Mm -hmm. This is how I think. Amen. This is how I understand things. Not that I of myself have come to the right conclusions and I see, oh, the Bible thinks the same thing, but that this has had a shaping influence on me. Not only in, in helping me how I think, but it's, it's an intimate level. Mm -hmm. What do you think brethren do that don't have the whole scripture? Some of these brethren that have hidden in China that have a chapter from John that's passed and worn out from family to family and memorized because that's all they have of the word of God. Is there no hope for them? Must they have the entire completed record if they have any hopes of being pleasing to God? 
See, that's what you really end up with if you want to come on a law approach, and it's the law approach, not approaching the law, a law approach to any segment of scripture, especially, and please don't misunderstand me, 1 Timothy, and some of these other areas that talk about the way things should be in a body that calls itself a church. If you come to that with a law approach, you will be the slave. You have no choice because you have already set the terms as you come. Also, you have written off myriads of those who have no First Timothy in any language they can read. Is there no hope for them? Any hope for their obedience? Any hope? Well, yes, because God is all-powerful. He's able to write his laws upon their heart and mind. Does this influence that? Does the written word impact your heart and mind? Well, of course. But for those that, that don't even have access to that, God is still able to guide them. He's still able to work with their conscience. He's still able to give them a sense of what to do. They're not without hope. Now, certainly they're in a, a great deficiency. It's far better to have all that God has given and not just a portion. But I, I would not want to end up with a conclusion that works only in the U.S. or only in the West. I would be very careful about that. With law, and, and by that, for me, God's mind, God's desire, God's will, what does he desire of, of any issue? With that as nature, with that written upon the inside of me, now I have liberty. I have freedom. I, I do not come as a slave. I come as a son. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference. Amen. Not a presumptuous son, but still a son. Again, we won't go through uh, all the passages that talk about the law and what God has done with it. There are some texts of scripture uh, that would make you uh, think possibly that law is just removed outright and we shouldn't even uh, speak of law at all in a new covenant setting. Uh, there's passages that make me think that uh, sometimes we think too Gentile about these things. When I read about the Jews that came to Christ all through the book of Acts, the law is very openly uh, spoken of. Uh, when there is Paul spoken to, why don't you go to the temple and, and keep the vow with these other men so these others can see that you keep the law? Now, Paul was a Jew, but he was a Christian. So there's a difference. I understand that. He's not gaining his righteousness by doing that, but it's still a part of who he is. And if I was addressing a uh, Semitic crowd, there would probably be a lot more interaction on what is the connection and, and how do we still honor our heritage and, and all those other things? But I am not. And I certainly have, am not the one to address that crowd anyway. I have not had that kind of, I've not had to wrestle with that. I, I think of one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there. You read of people described this way in the New Covenant Scriptures. It makes me very hesitant to speak against the law. I do not want to be found in that category. Some brief remarks on, on this issue, and then I'll close off and we'll move on. Uh, the issue of, of Matthew chapter 5, the start of the Sermon on the Mount, very early in that, very early in it, he says, Think not that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I came not to destroy but to fulfill for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass away from the law, till all things be accomplished. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. Those are strong words. Uh, this one that I've selected to take some quotes from is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, The Cost of Discipleship. He writes, After all Jesus had said, the disciples might well have thought like Martian, who was an early centuries heretic, this one who accused the Jews of tampering with the text. Martian, who in his copy of this passage said, Think ye that I am come to fulfill the law and the prophets? I am not come to fulfill, but to destroy. There's a change there. 
Many others since Martian have read and expounded this saying of Jesus as if that were what he said. Have you ever noticed that? Go to the commentaries and see how they wrestle with what he says in Matthew 5. Well, he, he can't be speaking of leaving the law intact. He, he's obviously destroyed it. And it, it's a presupposition that is brought to the text, and so they wrestle with the language, and Jesus just says it's very clear, straightforward, and goes on. So I want to be very careful how I speak of the law. And, and, and perhaps making a distinct, distinction between law that God has given and law that man has engineered, certainly there's something there. Making a distinction between law that is given and the bondedness to law that man has. And perhaps a distinction there between the code itself and our obligation to the code for our righteousness. There's a distinction there. Bonhoeffer goes on in his writing to uh, affirm that Jesus is the person that stands between our obligation to the law. He is the one that has fulfilled it for righteousness. He's the one that has taken the sting of sin away, Amen. that strength of sin that is the law. He's the one that has uh, obtained that for us. So please, again, don't misunderstand me. But I want to be very careful that I do not affirm something that opposes what Jesus said so categorically. And speaking of that Sermon on the Mount, I think it is a grave mistake for us to think that coming into a new covenant somehow means that we have less of an obligation to God and we have a means of a lower personal standard of righteousness. Jesus said about our righteousness exceeding that of scribes and Pharisees. And when I first would read that, I'd think, well, these guys are straining out their solutions so there's not a gnat in them. And uh, the attentiveness to detail, anybody that knows me knows I, I'm not going to be able to fulfill that. I can't even find my pencil or keys or anything from day to day. How am I going to remember all these rituals and routines? How can I exceed that? Certainly what Jesus is pointing to is the righteousness he gives us. That exceeds theirs. It's an imputed righteousness. And by that, we far exceed the Pharisees. But I don't want to use imputed righteousness as an excuse for my own laziness. And I want to be very careful that as a child of a new covenant, that I am not passed up by children of an old covenant in terms of devotion and desire and zeal. If we have any hope as the church of reaching Jews with their Messiah. You think of some of these Hasidic Jews, some of these very orthodox men and women. If we come across as lazy and casual and haphazard, we will never be able to show them the Messiah. They will not give us a second thought if they see us as just so much flash and to have no substance. Now that Sermon on the Mount that's the law written on the heart and mind. That's where the shift comes. That's, he, gives, he gives example after example of that. Law says don't kill. I say, and he shifts. Suddenly, l let me illustrate this way. The law, which is outside man, says don't kill. But I say, now the Lord, the Lord of the Sabbath, the one who is over all regulation, over all of man's requirements, he has said, the thought of hatred will end in your judgment. Mm -hmm. Do you see how that commandment has now become internalized? Mm -hmm. And likewise, our responsibility and obligation has been internalized. Amen. And if you read the Sermon on the Mount without a view of the cross, you are without hope. Amen. Try and read through that and think, this is what's required. I have to turn the other cheek. I have to go the extra mile. I have to do everything that violates my old nature and I don't have any resources for doing it. Why, it's a more strict law than the Old Covenant. Amen. In the Old Covenant, I could entertain all manner of thoughts of hatred and mayhem and vengeance and violence. I just never killed anybody. I could beat them nearly to death. Yeah. <laughs> if I could get out of the certain commandments, this and that, I could maybe beat them nearly to death, but if I didn't kill them, then I, I'm free. Likewise, Jesus goes on to talk about lust, he talks about all these other issues that all the law said was not to take uh, some other man's wife, not to covet them. But if I could maybe wrangle around and find a loophole and have all kinds of wives. 
or maybe just entertain in all manner of fantasy. The new covenant does not allow for that. Amen. The old covenant, a wayward man could still be just as wayward, just as wild and reprobate in his mind and heart, though externally very righteous. Very much revered by the people. But now the laws, my laws, God's laws, written on the heart and mind. Now that's, there's no room for that. Now, now we repent, we repent not, not for, for murder. We repent for hatred. We repent for anger. We repent for the word said that shouldn't have been said. And for the word thought that shouldn't have been thought. Do you see the intensification that has occurred? Jesus did not destroy the law. He amplified it. Yes, amen. He did the exact opposite. Amen. He took it. He fulfilled it. He took it out of our way, yes. And it no longer is a hindrance between us and God. And it does not amen. stand between us. He took it out of the way, yes, from Ephesians 2. And it no longer divides Jew and Gentile. Mm -hmm. That wall of partition has been removed. But to say that it has been extinguished, he did not say that. And the scriptures do not affirm that. Amen. We, we can fulfill the law. Mm -hmm. Over and over it talks about love. Read in Galatians, read in Ephesians, read in these other places that talk about love being the fulfillment of the law. Romans 13 is another passage. Mm -hmm. Do you realize what it requires to love your neighbor as yourself? Do you realize what it requires to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? This is not something that you can just say, oh yeah, I've done that already. Sister June talking earlier about the checklist. Oh, my path to righteousness. I've done that already. That is something that whenever those occasions come to love neighbor as self, you have to kill yourself. You have to, you have to put it down. Because the old man is going to fight against that and wrestle. It goes against your nature. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Amen. It's deeper. Shall I be pleased with rivers of oil and thousands of lambs? No. It goes beyond any of the physical sacrifices. I, I appreciate the heart of some of those saints of old that thought that God needed a pilgrimage or God wanted them to do some manner of physical violence to themselves. And I can appreciate the spirit in wanting to please God, but it's the wrong covenant again. Even if you could die for your own sins, you would still just be dead. You needed one to come and stand between. Amen. I, I think of Paul as an example of this laws written on the mind and on the heart. When he gets after the church for some of the problems that have erupted there at Corinth, he doesn't, st say, uh, he doesn't uh, state just verse after verse from the law. He doesn't get into Leviticus about the rules on nakedness and so on and say, now you be sure and tell that man that's with his father's wife that this is what the law said. That's not it. He says, you're a temple. Mm -hmm. You're a temple of God. How can you take what belongs to God and give it to someone else and join it to a harlot? Mm -hmm. Paul doesn't deal with those, any of those issues by just citing some code. Amen. Jesus said, boom, and then that's the end of the debate. He appeals to their new nature. He says, Amen. this is the way you are. Amen. And likewise, this is going to impact then what you do and what you don't do. Amen. The law goes from being the outline of a mold that comes around us and presses us in, and all that comes out that's extra is cut off, and any gaps we have are filled in, and so psh, we're produced. We are a clone now. Because we have been through the mold of the law. That is not it. The law is no longer that way. The law is now that seed. Alien to our old nature, but not alien to God. A seed that is now planted within us that begins to grow and take over the regions. Mm -hmm. It begins to work into our mind. It works into our finances, our family, and all these other things that, that people will focus on. It does. It impacts all those. Because that seed continues to grow as we feed and as we nurture it. Amen. But that's a law written on our heart and mind. It impacts all these other areas. The law, no longer the mold, becomes an inherent quality of our new nature. It is not uh, that God has to take us and force us and tie us and grab us and overwhelm us. 
It is that God has now made us like him in a way that never could have happened before. Amen. Again, like we began, it transcends the external likeness. Amen. We are not like him only in what we desire to do, but also in, in who we are. And that gives us the power for the other. Amen. There are some other things I have here. I'm editing because I've addressed them. Suffice to say that when we talk about God's laws being written on our heart and mind, we are talking about God's mind being given to us. Amen. That's an incredible thing to think about. That Amen. I remember talking to a friend of mine when I'm early in the faith and you still have that early zeal where it just doesn't seem like there's anything else you can talk about until you get old and get beat up for a while and then you kind of think, well, maybe I'll get another chance. Everyone knows what I'm talking about. I'm not saying it's right. But that early zeal you have and you're talking about... And I remember him saying, how can you have the mind of God? You know, maybe it was me because he knew me better than others did. I don't know. But his wrestling was, here is God who is holy and beyond and infinite, the Lord of hosts. And here is man, that an enlightened man, an inspired man like David, such a worm. What am, what am I? If you operate with a worm mentality too often and too long, you will never rise up you will beat yourself into the ground. You must acknowledge, yes, that all I have is because of him. It is not of, of myself. It is not of my own strength and my own willfulness and character and good breeding. It's not of anything that I've brought to the equation. It's what he has brought. And yes, I, by his grace, have responded. And there have been many that have been, had the opportunity and not responded. So uh, to that degree, yes, I guess there's something that I can certainly say, well, I, I responded. There's something I brought. But we are sons and daughters of the Most High. Of, we of all people would have his mind written upon our mind, his heart, his desires. I think of all the presentations I've heard that, that talk about the, the need for, for missions work, and by that usually implied being outside our native country. You can't just do that because you're supposed to. You, you want to go to China? You want to obey God? God says go to China. We somehow, it seems that we get it. Well, I would do that. I, if he ever gave a clear call, I'd go to China. All right, but what about if he says you need to be patient? You need to wait because somebody's wasting your time. Did you ever have anybody waste your time? Telling you something that you've been told 14 times before? but they need to tell you again? What if God wants you to do that? What if God wants you to just get up out of bed again? And there's times where that's hard too. Sometimes we can fool ourselves in thinking that we would do the grandest and the greatest and we leave the least just kind of pass by or excused. I've asked myself, would an elimination of the law, if it was just obliterated, would that eliminate my guilt? It wouldn't. I, my action would still be the same in history. Uh, somehow, if laws could be repealed in our country, it wouldn't change the error of what I have done. What I need is, is someone to, one, pay the penalty for the price that I have cost, to pay, to serve my sentence out that I'm unable to s serve myself. I'm needing that kind of intercessor, one, to remove what I have done. But I am also needing someone to free me from the bondage to the law in the present and in the future. Because if all I have is a forgiveness for the past, that's not going to be enough because I'm not dead yet. I'm still going to have this, and I may still have to deal with that. So I need a, a double deliverance, not only from the guilt of my past, but also from my bondedness to a law of the present. If I walk before God under the law, there is no hope. There is no hope of finding his mind. There's no hope of being holy enough, loving God enough, again, as Sister June has said. Here are some things as we begin to draw to a close. 
If you struggle with this, if you, you get back into the Old Covenant Scriptures, you get back into uh, First Chronicles, and you wonder, why, why is this in here? Why am I reading this? The precepts have changed, but the principles never do. Amen. When you read back, you look for what was God doing here and what is he trying to tell his people? You can read all of Leviticus about the, the cleanliness and the leprosy of the wall and the leprosy of the flesh and how to diagnose that and all these things. And, and there's some interesting historical notes, no question about it. But the principle behind it, my people are to be holy. My people are to be separate. Not separate as in living on an island, no one can touch them, but separate as in we aren't like that. And that's, you can go through the whole the whole of scripture that way. Amen. By the way, that's a good way of going through the New Covenant scriptures too. Because if we just focus on a precept and we come at it with that legalistic, or we'll just say legal, mentality, we're going to get the wrong conclusion. We're going to miss the principle. That's in fact what they were doing in Jesus' day. They would, they would strain out a gnat, but swallow the camel. They would be precise to an incredible degree on not eating unclean things, but miss Something as, as plain as mercy and faithfulness and judgment. Look for the principle. Two principles that have never changed. God is holy. That's the first one. That's never changed. That's true all the way through. Genesis through Revelation. All through the record. He is holy in, in at least two senses. One, he is separate from sin in his nature. But he is also separate from sin in his fellowship. And that's why you read the difference in the Old Covenant walk and the New Covenant walk. Because the people had not come to a point where they could have fellowship with God. God's still holy, still holy in his nature and in what he can fellowship with. Why do you think Israel before Mount Sinai says, Moses, we've heard God's voice, we don't want to hear it anymore. You speak with us. And all he did was speak those Ten Commandments. And it just terrified the people. There's a separation. And yet, in a new covenant, it's the issue of come. The second principle that never changes is God's people must be holy in, in order for them to have fellowship with their God. Amen. Now, that was true in Israel, and, and these laws were trying to, to get people that are from an infant state and grow them through juvenile and adolescence and begin to show them, okay, this is what holiness is about. Holiness is about what you do, it's about what you think, it's about where you go, it's, a, it's about all these issues. And maybe the law breaks it down to these details, certainly to show man he can't do it of his own. But there's the principle always in there. My people will be holy. My people will be holy. And now that is true for us as well. That if we, if we want to have fellowship with God, we cannot fellowship with God while we are indulging our lower self. While we are living at a distance from God, there's no fellowship there. Amen. I remember working uh, years ago in a hardware store and this woman uh, was living with a man and she told me how in the bed the night before she had shared Jesus with him and she was so happy about that. And I just, you know, I was 20 and been married maybe a month. And I just, how can you possibly in the midst of this wickedness hope to give him any kind of message of a savior? Jesus didn't save you to be wicked. So again, God's people will be holy, and that is a realm where you can have fellowship. The precepts may have changed to, due to the shift in the covenant access of the people to God. I'm going to say that again. The precepts between an old covenant and a new covenant, they have shifted because of the covenant access of the people. We did not have access if we had been born a thousand, uh, let's see, 3,500 years ago. We wouldn't have had the access. The, the rule at Mount Sinai was stay back. Stay back. Mm -hmm. Tell the people to remain away from the mountain. And God had to because of his own holiness and of their unholiness. It required that. But of Mount Zion. Yeah. But of Mount Zion it says, Now it will come about that in the last days the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains mm -hmm. and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. Well, that's come. That's not stay back. And many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. 
For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. That's from Isaiah chapter 2. Amen. In the first episode, God is holy and the people are unholy, so there is a very limited fellowship. It is through sacrifices and through offerings. And, and on occasion, you would have some unique individual like David that would have a, a faith and begin to rise beyond that covenant, begin to see this is what's really been here all along. In the second episode, God is holy, and the people have been made holy through an intercessor, through that work of the Lamb of God, through his death, and so we can have fellowship. The precepts do differ, but the principles do not. Commandments presume distance or ignorance. Amen. If, if you need to put a sign up about something, it's clear that other people don't realize that this is wrong or this, this is right or whatnot. It's a distance and ignorance. But at intimacy and understanding, commandments become rarely necessary. Any of you that are married have seen this, where you grow to understand each other, and so there has to be less talk of, you need to do this, better do that. And certainly that's true. Any of you that are raising or have raised children can see that, where they go from that stage of, I am the law, the law of their father. I don't need to explain. I don't need to give a, a treatise on why this needs to be done. It needs to be done. And they get to that point of trust and responsibility and accountability. They've grown, and you begin to have a covenant of grace with your children, and they've left the time of law. Now, if I, I command my children, if I tell them to do something, they should obey me for at least three reasons. One is because they love me, because of their own desire to please me. The second is because I love them and I have their best interests in mind and I am a good man and I'm not seeking my own way, I'm seeking their best. A third reason is because I created them. I brought them in. And I, as such, again, this is a faint shadow of our relationship, but I have the authority to demand compliance and I have the strength to ensure it. I'm still bigger than them. I'm still stronger than they are. And I can take their no and I can make it yes. Now of those three, their love for me, my love for them, or the fact that I'm just bigger than they are, which, which one of those do you think begins to describe our relationship with God? Uh, they're difficult to separate and rank. They're all true. We have a love for God. God has a love for us. And the third one is true. He's bigger than we are. He has the ability to demand and ensure compliance. But what is the new covenant like? Is the new covenant like that third one? Where if we get out of line, God is going to knock us back in the next week and he's just going to come down? I certainly hope that my own children would grow to a point where I don't need even the threat of authority to elicit from them my desire and their behavior. God's law is written on my heart and on my mind. They don't have to be written on my flesh by his punishment. Amen. They don't have to be written through ropes and shackles to drag me in a way that I really don't want to go. They're written on my heart. They are what I desire. Here's another issue. What if, what if there's no commandment about the dilemma you face? If you come with a law approach and you face a circumstance and you can't find a verse that specifically addresses this, if you don't have God's laws written on your heart and mind, you're, you're without hope. You're without revelation. But if you have those laws written on your heart and mind and you face these circumstances where you can't find uh, a direct command, an inference, a historical example, if you don't have any means at all of navigating, you've got a conscience now. And that conscience has been reshaped by the word of God and the, you are able to navigate in even these difficult areas. Now your navigation may conclude that I just need to pray. I need to just stop whatever I'm doing. I need to pray for a while because I, I don't know which way to go. Two options, neither of which are wicked, for example. Nothing specific. If you're coming with only a law, then if God hasn't said it, there's no hope for any confident action. But if God's law is written on your heart and mind, even if you can't find a precept to guide you, 
you have, you have guidance. You have a means of navigating. I think of animals, and I think that that's how some people view man. That they are wild, rebellious, they must be broken. I, I hope that I am more than just some Mustang. Some wild horse that God has to sweep down with his law and tie up and break before I can come to him. Hopefully I've gotten to a point of yieldedness where the ropes are on my mind and heart and not on my bones where I am a willing servant, where I am not as the horse that needs bit and bridle, where I can be guided by his eye. Amen. Amen. Now, men and women may not be beasts, but outside observation will not always confirm that because man is certainly able to be worse than animals. Animals act because of instincts that their engineer designed into them. Humans made in the image of God must violate their design code in order to be beastly. In, in conclusion, we who are aliens of nature, by, at the very start, we've been adopted. We've, we have changed categories and status to an infinite degree. Amen. Gone from just the highest of creation to the, high, the most beloved in his house and in his home. Mm -hmm. We have gone from being foreigners to being family, from slaves to being sons and daughters. From being, like he said in Hosea, not my people, to being called my people. Mm -hmm. And those kind of people have God's laws written on their heart and mind. Amen. I want to close by reading a final passage uh, from Deuteronomy 30. It is selections from chapter 30. You shall again obey the Lord and observe all his commandments which I command you today. If you obey the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in this book of the law. If you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. For this commandment which I command you today is not too difficult for you, nor is it out of reach. It is not in heaven that you should say who will go up to heaven for us to get it for us. And make us hear it that we may observe it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will cross the sea for us to get it for us? And make us hear it that we may observe it. But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may observe it. Amen. And then verse 20. By loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice and by holding fast to him. For this is your life and the length of your days. That you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. Pray with me, please. Our God and our Father, we give you thanks, Lord, for your written word, for your revelation to all of mankind. We thank you, Father, that you have given us a Holy Spirit that can live within us, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit that knows the things of your mind and can bring them to the things of our mind. We thank you, Father, that you have desired to make yourself known, to make yourself accessible. We pray now, Father, that you would help, help us as we seek to have your word continually engrafted and implanted in our minds.